Hey everybody, welcome to 3 Minute Thursdays, your source of film rights news and gossip packed into a short, sweet 3 minutes in everyone's favorite day. It's a Thursday, it's not a Thursday, it's a Friday, we've done this routine. So my video production has clearly slowed down lately. I'm not really sure anyone cares, including me, because it's YouTube. It's not that serious. But I still enjoy making videos, so I'll keep doing it. But obviously the frequency is different, so that's just a, a reminder to keep the subscriptions and the notifications turned on so you know when I put out a new video, because I know you're all waiting. Uh, the Cranky Vegan Patreon, we sent $2,710 to Noble Sanctuary in Washington State to help them with their work and good news. This month your Patreon donation is going to be doubled. Doubled. It's gonna be double. We have a uh, matching donor. They're gonna throw down and match dollar for dollar. So if you are a patron or you have been thinking about joining, do it before December 31st and have your gifts matched. Okay, so when I'm endlessly scrolling through your social media accounts, I jot down little notes if I see something that jumps out at me, both positive and negative. And since it's been a hot minute, I wanna mention a few of these as quickly as I possibly can so we can get on to this movie review. And of course, if you don't want to watch the news, just jump ahead. It looks like the UK is one step closer to banning live exports. I'm looking at all the UK folks to chime in here. But it sounds like a good step forward, as the government's been putting the ban back on the agenda with the notion that it's going to happen. So activists have like literally given up their lives for this fight. Um, and I think it would be an important step forward. So tell me your thoughts down below. Uh, does it sound like a good thing? Are we moving in the right direction? Over in Canada, groups like Animal Justice have been pushing for a ban on the import and export of elephant and rhino ivory, and they won. The new ban is one of the toughest out there and is in response to the killing of 25,000 elephants and 1,300 rhinos every year in Africa. You probably saw that awful drone footage of Romeo, uh, the manatee at the Miami Sea Aquarium. You know, that, that place that kept Toki in captivity for over 50 years. Well, Romeo and uh, Juliet were held there in captivity for over 60 years. You know when people are like, uh, what's wrong with aquariums? This, this is what's wrong with aquariums. Don't go to them. Anyway, they've been moved out of the aquarium and into, well, unfortunately they got moved into a zoo. But I'm, I'm trying to be happy for, for Romeo and, and Juliet. They are getting to interact with other manatees and make new friends. They get to eat better food. They're in a critical care center getting rehab. Uh, I'm trying to look past the fact that in 2018, the head vet at Tampa Zoo was accused of accidentally killing two manatees uh, with their terrible care. So, <laughs> so while this is a step forward for Romeo and Julia, it shouldn't be the end goal. Like life is complicated and complex. We get to be both happy and unsatisfied for these manatee and uh, of course continue the fight. The Furred Animal Defense League and Chainsaw the Fur Trade, which is an am amazing name. I don't know if it's like a really long acronym, I don't know, or just that they are literally calling for the chainsawing of the industry. But, but either way, I'm, I'm here for it. They have been doing a campaign against a retailer that sells, or, or rather sold, fur called Sudi. Sudi? Wasn't, wasn't she in Jersey Shore? I'm not trashy, unless I drink too much. I don't know. They had been doing a pressure campaign for almost two months, and in that time, a whole lot had happened. But the short of the long is that they have pledged to get rid of fur, which is amazing. Nice job, everyone. Brooklyn, Massachusetts uh, recently voted overwhelmingly to prohibit the sale of mammals and birds by pet stores and to ban the use of wild animals by circuses and, and other traveling acts. Now, I like these bans in particular because it's a, like a shining example of what you can do if you are creative. You work hard and you stick to your goals because these bans aren't being passed by big organizations with huge budgets. They're being passed by a couple of kids. And I don't mean like kids in a derogatory way, but they're literally kids. They're teenagers. Teenagers, like the, the young adult section in a library. Ezra and Hannah are 16 and they spearheaded these campaigns while going to high school. I don't know what you were doing in high school, but I sure as hell wasn't doing all of this amazing stuff. And you might be thinking, why does this sound familiar? That's because Ezra spearheaded the successful campaign to ban fur sales in Brooklyn, Massachusetts, which of course he won. And of course he did it when he was, he was 14 years old. So <laughs> thanks Ezra for making all the rest of us look bad. I say all this not as a reminder that our high school years were a waste compared to Ezra and Hannah, but rather I think it's a great illustration of like how important um, grassroots movements are, right? We often look at campaigning and say, eh, it takes too much time or too much money or we don't have the resources for that or it's too complicated to figure out how to get a band passed. But the reality is if we are creative and we are committed, we can do these things on our own or with a couple of friends, uh, our high school friends. And there are people like Ezra and Hannah out there who have had these successes and I'm sure would be happy to talk to you about how they did it, come up with an idea, create a network, do the hard work, and of course, win. Okay, have, have you seen this new documentary, The Smell of Money? Um, it just came out. Uh, my short review, 
you absolutely should see it. Head on over to the smellofmoneydoc.com to find out how they got all the links there. But if you want more info, I got it for you. Of course, of course I have an opinion. I think it was great, but well, it's not really but, but and. So our movement, uh, with the exception of sanctuaries, we almost exclusively operate within the confines of urban life. And that very real life consequence of living on the front lines of a lot of these animal issues um, is either ignored or dismissed by us as quote, not an animal issue. And I think that's a huge mistake on our part for, for a lot of reasons. For starters, vegan educators, you know, they focus on the ethical implications of animal agriculture for the most part, but there is always a lot of talk about the environmental and human implications as well. We break it down to numbers and statistics and charts, but who is behind those numbers and statistics? What lives are they being forced to live and why? What are the actual consequences on humans in the environment of animal agriculture? What does that look like? Do we as like vegan educators actually know? I think way more often than not, the answer is, eh, I don't know. Which ultimately means that educators are using those statistics to make a point rather than actually caring. And I think most people on the receiving end of this education can see through that performative activism. If you don't actually know or care, that shines through. We often find it difficult to get humans to make that connection, right? Between themselves and non-human uh, suffering on these farms and other places. There isn't a bridge there that brings those two worlds together very easily that the common person can relate to. And, and I think the smell of money is really one of those first attempts to really do that and do it successfully. So like on a systemic level, the documentary does a great job of illustrating in, in no uncertain terms, the concept of environmental racism. One of the most striking parts of the movie for me was when they overlaid a map of CAFOs, the concentrated animal feeding operations, on top of a map of where the percentage of the population of North Carolina was once enslaved. And the amount of factory farms clearly was much higher in places that were historically black and lower income. It was almost a perfect match. It was startling. The film shows how these big agriculture operations move in. They take over people's lands that have been owned for generations, some bought by people after they had been released from slavery and passed down through generations. And then these animal ag um, corporations take it and set up their operations like sometimes within feet of their property lines. One of the biggest perpetrators is of course, Smithfield Foods, that's probably no surprise. Um, the largest pig and pork producer in the world. They reported at one time to be killing 32,000 pigs a day. And those pigs, they gotta be raised somewhere, right? And that is in CAFOs, next door to the individuals in the film. In order to manage the pig waste produced, they simply took the piss and shit and turned it into a slurry and then fertilized the company's fields, which basically means having a mist of pig waste spread into the air. Smithfield put these fields literally in the community's backyards, which meant like a host of dangerous and deadly health conditions that you're breathing in. It meant literally being sprayed with a mist of pig feces whenever people walked out of their doors. It meant the groundwater was polluted, the rivers and fish were dying, and zero consequences, of course, for the company. Until the community started organizing. It's a story of unlikely allies, which I love, right? Frontline communities working with environmentalists, working with fed up pig farmers, working with attorneys, all of them coming together to fight back. Now, I can hear a lot of you wanting to ask your favorite question. Uh, but are they vegan? Are these people vegan? And here's where I ask you to resist doing that. For years, I've made the case that the moral baseline shouldn't automatically be veganism. It should be an early step forward for sure. However, I personally think our moral baseline should be activism. I think if these folks sat inside their houses suffering from cancer and asthma that came from breathing the air around the pig farms and try not to be drenched in liquefied pig shit whenever they walk outside and to combat all of that, they sat inside and, and ate vegan bacon in hopes that a $14 billion company would just crumble because of it, I'm guessing nothing would change. But if they joined forces with unlikely allies and became stronger because of it and say, hypothetically, they went after the company, no, no spoilers, of course, and tried to financially cripple them to the tune of almost a billion dollars, I know which situation and outcome I'd personally prefer. Veganism is important. And it's what we should strive for, of course, but I don't think it has to be the first stop on the way to fighting against animal agriculture. Instead, we should look at what is smart, what is strategic, what is effective in taking down these massive industries. And this documentary illustrates how that can be done by finding unlikely allies and meeting each other where we all are at politically and moving forward together. The question for us as animal rights activists then becomes, do we join this union and help move it forward? Or do we stick to our tired playbooks that have left us and the animals stagnant? Keep fighting.